Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Oh, my goodness. I am so excited about today's show. Yeah. First of all, I want to awesome, awesome books. But I want to tell you, Gabby and Gabby and Marin is joining us here today with two mega books. I have to tell you, I got these books and I'm thinking to myself, I got them from Sarah and I'm thinking to myself how amazing it must be to be her. How amazing it must be to be, uh, yeah. Gabby Ann Marin. Now, why do I say that? Well, here, here's the books. Here's what we're going to talk about today. Gods and goddesses, right? The rise of divine mythologies. And then, are you ready? Monsters and creatures discover beasts from lore and legends. And so today, I am thrilled to introduce all of you to Gabby Ann, but more importantly, to the creative, historical, amazing body of work. She's an award-winning author, screenwriter, editor, academic, and lover of all things supernatural. Yay for us. And joining us here today with what I believe is really taking us on a journey into what most of us who are really tied in and have been from a very young age understand about the energy around this. That's why today I'm so thrilled to have Gabby and join us here today. Gabby, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here. Oh, what is it like to be you? That's <laughs> my <good>. question. <laughs> I, I have to say I've, I've been very blessed and, and had a lot of opportunity to explore stuff that I love. So, you know, you've got to be happy with that. Can I ask you, let's start at the beginning for, I can only imagine, I know what my childhood was like. Uh, any chance I got, I was going to see the monster movies. I had all the comic books. I, I was completely immersed in another world. And, you know, as a matter of fact, my, my family sent me to therapy because they thought there's something wrong with this kid. Uh, but, but here we are today. What was your childhood experience like, if I could ask? Yeah, uh, look, we we didn't have a lot of money uh, growing up. I was yeah. I'm a I'm a twin actually, so there were two of us. Uh, but when I was about seven, my mum bought took us to a bookshop, a secondhand bookshop, and said you can buy any book you like in the store. And I came out with the complete unnatural history of the vampire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so even at that age, I was interested in this sort of stuff. We didn't have a television until I was about that same age, until I was about seven. So I just read, um, and I read so much. Um, and and I loved mythology. I loved scary books. Um, I, I was completely indiscriminate, but um, just, yeah, always drawn to the the kind of creatures and the – and the, the supernatural things. So let me ask you, I have two of these incredible books in front of me. And the reason I love these is not only do you take us on this fantastic educational journey, but I thought I knew pretty much a, a lot about this. And yet, as I read the book and I started to read what you say about things, I was really struck by how vividly you write and describe things. And I can't help but imagine what your past life was like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I I often I, I often feel like I've I've some connection 
um, certainly to to some of the more um, I don't know interesting times in the in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I really feel I feel quite immersed when I write, and that's always true. And I think it's my job as a writer to pass that on uh, to my reader so that they can experience what I'm experiencing when I'm writing it. I want to talk about gods and goddesses first, and I don't know why, but I am finding uh, probably resurgence is not the right word, but I, I don't know a better word. But I'm finding that gods and goddess energy have risen so fast, so accelerated. And, and how do I know this? I mean, we're seeing it in our pop culture. For example, when we started with Hollywood and we started with movies like Avatar, everybody thought, nope, that's it. That's one movie. But then this whole wave started where we started to see the comic book characters come to life. We started to see old favorites like King Kong come to life. We started to see Thor, Thor, Wonder Woman. What is happening? You know, is it part of, you know, some of the things you say in the book, is it part of remembering or is there a new energy from your perspective? I think I think we've never forgotten. Um, oh. I think it's it's just these the culture moves on really fast, and particularly now. And I think we're always looking for ways to connect to something that is bigger and and profound for us. And mythologies and gods and goddesses have always been our way to express that um, and to talk about that. So it completely makes sense that at a time when I think a lot of us are quite lost spiritually and yeah. and really searching for things, that we're going back to those old stories and we're finding the truth in them um, because the truth never went away. It just they just had different ways of being expressed. Um, but as I as I sort of talk about in the book, none of these gods and goddesses have gone away. They've just evolved into to new ways of us to understand that energy and connect to it. And as I said, they say so much about us yeah. uh, as people. Yeah. I, I love the way you wrote the book. I was very surprised to see you start out and probably because – I'm ignorant pretty much about the topic when it comes to somebody like you. But to start out with the sun, the moon, and the earth, I was very relieved because there's such a prominent part of metaphysical world, astrology, numerology. And as I talked about before, my planet, Jupiter, moves into Sagittarius now for a year. I'm so happy. Uh, I, I mean... Why would I even be talking about that on air if there wasn't a sense of it? But tell us about the sun, the moon, and the earth and the role it has played in defining societies, right, because it has, but also mm -hmm. guiding cultures. Yeah, so I think, again, it comes back to this idea that we've, we've lost a little bit, um, but as you yeah. say, I think we're reconnecting to it. This idea that the earth and the moon and the sun and the ocean and the wind and all these natural forces have an incredible amount of power and we are subject to that power. We, we try and control it, um, but we've actually just had a massive flood here. <laughs> and yeah. It's a real reminder. And of course there's the terrible bushfires as well um, yeah. in your country. Yeah. And it's, it's a reminder that these things are incredibly powerful and that power is something that needs to be respected um, and understood and worked with. And that energy, if we incorporate that into our lives um, and understand how to work with the earth, work with the natural yeah. energies and natural forces, our lives are so much richer for that. Yeah. Um, and it also gives us a sense of place. It gives us a sense of belonging and connection um, if we connect into those energies, because it's where we live. It's the heat that is given to us. It is the water that nurtures us and lets us live. Um, so I think, uh, and that was something that we understood instinctively as a people right back in the very early days. And, of yeah. course, we deified that because that was our way of showing respect. Right. Um, um, and I think 
as we moved further away from that and we built cities and we kind of cut ourselves off from the natural world, our gods and our goddesses changed and they became more human, which is also really interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think that reconnection to those natural um, spiritual traditions is really a testament to the fact, again, we haven't forgotten it. This, you know, we're, 70% water, something like that, in our actual yeah. bodies. Yeah. So we connect to all of this stuff. Um, and so it makes sense when when you tell these stories. And I, I, I've been going and telling these stories, doing a few readings in libraries. And um, the, the original story in the book that I talk about, which is not a traditional story, it's my reworking, my reinterpretation yeah. of a lot of um, ancient ideas. But... That's very, very popular, you know, because everyone can connect to it. There's nothing divisive in that. We all understand what the sun is. We all understand what the earth is. We all understand what the ocean is. So it's a way to bring people together, whatever their cultural or spiritual tradition. Well, I was fascinated. I, I mean, I think I intuitively knew this, but most cultures have the sun as the male, right? Yes. Uh, and the moon as the female, except in the Japanese mythology. And, um, and I thought about this for a minute because when I think about Japanese culture and I think about, you know, imagery, the sun plays a prominent role. Uh, do you think that perhaps for that particular culture, what did they know that was different, do you think, about the other cultures around this? Yeah, I think it's – I think there's a, a – a difference in the way that we see feminine and masculine energy. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, and there is this kind of idea that masculine energy is more kind of out there and pushy and 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 aggressive. Um, mm. And so when you're looking at a fiery ball, you sort of think, oh, masculine. But when you sort of look at the, the way, and, and Japan is definitely one of them, but there are a couple of others. The Australian Indigenous culture believed in the sun woman. Um, and so you yes. see that there is that understanding, that connection to the inherent power of women and a respect for that. And, and they tend to be cultures that respect their elders, um, respect the, the wisdom, um, respect kind of the, the intellectual pursuit um, as much as the physical. Uh, uh it, it, as you look at this, and I'm thinking that, uh, again, I'm thinking I'm you, uh, I'm struck by the web that the book weaves, right? Just the way you're talking about it. You know, it's this beautiful web that gets that gets woven in this. You know, everything from, I got to say, one of my favorites, she's on my wall in the other room. My friends think out of all the goddesses that you could pick, did you really pick these three? Giant poster, Madame Pele from Hawaii. Yes. Big red on that wall. You don't go near that picture, right? There's a yeah. level of respect for it. She's on the wall. You don't move her. In the other room is Athena. Um, and so yeah. my question is, looking at gods and, and goddesses, how, how do we connect the dots from your perspective? for some of the ancient gods and goddesses you cite in the book and and uh, for lack of a better word sort of the evolution of them to the time before they weren't anymore yeah 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 it's it's interesting actually because i'm sitting here at my uh, computer in sydney and i have bridget um <laughs> and i have Quan yin sitting by my computer so i yeah. completely connect like we're in my different aspects of what I do and you mentioned yeah. at the beginning that I've got lots of things I've got academic and I've got creative yeah. and so I will think about those gods and goddesses and I, I have some god stuff as well I have pan in my garden because I think you know the nature spirit um and so it's just just to have those psychological reminders that there was, particularly for me, I, I feel it's really important to know there was a time when women were respected, were um, revered, were considered powerful, 
And that power was about mercy and about intellect and about love and beautiful wisdom um, as well as, you know, destruction and um, anger and, and a whole lot of other things. So just having the ability to connect to something that reminds me of that allows me to feel that power in myself. So yeah. I spend quite a bit of time thinking about what goddess energy, what god energy would be good in what space um, and do, do yeah, spend quite a bit of time thinking about that. When I was writing the book, I absolutely wanted to have Athena in there because she's one of my favourites. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think she's really interesting because she is a goddess of war and a goddess of peace. Yes. And I think that's fantastic to have that ability to have those two what seem like contradictory, conflicting ideas embodied in one person. And what she's talking about is she's talking about the importance of understanding where one is required and that both are equally important. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's incredible wisdom that we sometimes yeah. lose. Well, I want, I want to ask you this question because as I'm, I'm reading the book and I'm, I'm reading about the various deities and the thing that I'm really struck by in, in the world right now is the resurgent of all the Norse gods and deities and, and, and why do I even say that? Well, mm -hmm. you don't have to turn on a television show or think about Thor or just look around. There seems to be this sort of emergence on, on the Norse deities that, by the way, most people didn't really know much about. I think some yeah. people, if you read the comic books, knew about Thor. But outside mm -hmm. of that, the Norse deities, they don't get much love, right? I mean, we know That's about right. Athena. We know about the Greeks, the Romans. Tell me about their role in the empowerment or the, I uh, should I say, the cultural structure that, you know, they have in, in cult carving out the world we live in today. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I have to, I have to preface this by saying that the Thor that we know from the Marvel universe is yeah. very much removed <laughs> yes. uh, from the, the mythology. And, and I think that's actually okay. I think what happens, as I said, is we use these ideas, we use these these entities, and then we contextualise them <clears throat> how they work for us. Um, and but the Thor universe in the Marvel is so masculine. Yeah. Um, and in actual fact, if you look at the um, uh, the Viking Norse mythology, the women are so incredibly important and there is a great sense and this is true of most of the pantheon gods where there are more than one you'll see that it's all about you know the difference of of the male and the female coming in and and giving each other a bit of balance yeah um so one of the the really interesting things about the nordic the norse kind of background it it absolutely has influenced um, particularly um, Celtic religions um, and fairies and all of that kind of stuff. So, we, again, we haven't lost it, but it just got reworked. And, and, um, but what it really talked about, the, the mythology was really, they were, they were an aggressive culture. They, uh, they weren't a war culture, and I think that's really important. They were warriors. Yeah. But... Um, the idea of strength and the idea of um, a lot of people were dying in battle um, because that was a culture. It was a very incredibly difficult time. They're also explorers and they were traders and all sorts of things as well. Um, but that, that idea of battle and that idea of, of courage and bravery was incredibly important to the mythology and all of the deities. Yeah imbue that in some way um they have this fantastic uh a group of people called the valkyries um who are essentially they've kind of been reimagined a little bit as angels oh okay. because their, their job was to go down and, and um, protect the the warriors and then once if a warrior uh, was killed 
make sure that that warrior got to Nirvana or to Asgard or to whichever of the, because there are a number of different afterlives, depending on how someone was killed. Yeah. Um, and so that that sort of sense of protection uh, in a very difficult, and even now I would say, I mean, I think the Nordic countries are absolutely beautiful, but they're not easy countries to live in. Yeah. Oh. Um, you know, from a natural um, environment standpoint. So yeah. having... Mm. A, a, a pantheon of gods who are there to protect you and to um, recognize your sacrifice and recognize your courage and your ability. And and again, there was actually I was reading the other day. Um, they've just discovered that one of the Viking graves that was unearthed quite a long time ago, um, a warrior grave. She's a woman, <laughs> um, oh, and they're all quite, yeah. kind of quite shocked. Yeah. But it's not shocking. If you actually look at the mythology, Freya and the Valkyries were female yeah. um, and they were warriors and Balder and Thor were male and they were warriors. And so there wasn't there wasn't that difference. Um, and I think that that was that, you know, everyone's going, oh, that's so amazing that it's a female. I'm thinking, have you read the mythology? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Do you understand? laughs> What's going on? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think again, we we sort of forget little bits, um, and we kind of try and put these into a perspective that makes sense from a modern sensibility, from a Western thought perspective. But if you pull back, it says so much about the culture um, that we're now discovering, you know, through archaeological and DNA and all these sorts of things. But it's all there. Yeah. Uh, your book is fascinating and for those of you just tuning in we're going to make sure you know how to get a copy of the book and we're going to give copies of, of a copy of each uh, away um uh, one of the things I'm, i i love about this is not only do you give us a brilliant education but you provide us with rituals you provide us with uh, you, you know a way to engage in the energies how important was that in writing the book yeah, I think that was really important because there's a lot of books, and, and I love these books, that are the mythology, that are the stories. But missing or not understanding how people engage with those stories and how they make them part of their lives and part of their reality is, is a big yeah. element of why these things are powerful. Um, and understand how civilizations kind of incorporate it yeah. these ideas into just everyday life. So one of the points that I make in the book is that one of the most powerful gods in most of the, the cultures don't have temples because they're household gods. They're the gods that are in your hearth, they're in your home, and you engage with them every day. And that, and now we forget those people or those, those entities because they don't have the big, you know, pyramids or the big... Uh, temples. I know. I know. A <laughs> friend of mine said to me the other day, um, her son uh, is, I think he's four or five. And so he's, he's singing this music. So I'm watching him with, uh, uh, on the, on the computer, on the YouTube, and it's a Celtic group. And this is a four-year-old that knows all of the words to this Celtic group, very popular Celtic group, and knows the words in Gaelic, right? No, and he's this four-year-old. He's like singing the song, and and then he's singing in English. And, and I'm just, I was fascinated by it. But you talk about the Celtic mytho mythology. See, I do believe that if I were to look across the board and see what 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 mythology is rising up right mm -hmm. nobody wants to pay attention to this because i don't think people connect the dots i don't think that they look at okay how picturesque how much pop culture how much in smaller cultural subsets uh we're seeing more of these natural spirits we're seeing more of them uh yeah. you know for me all I could think about is Kate Blanchett, uh, like in the what was the what was the movie she was in playing the fairy? The Lord right? of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. There we go. 
but we don't make the connection. Do you think that this is just my point of view? Do you mm-hmm. think that the Celtic gods and goddesses are totally underrepresented in the way we connect the dots between who they were and how we portray them today? I think it depends on where you are, uh, because I think in in Celtic um, countries with with strong Celtic roots, Ireland and Scotland and and in some cases Great Britain and Wales, there is much more of a connection to them and there is much more of sort of an everyday sort of understanding and the the mythology and the stories are passed down and are talked about and are are used in a a much more everyday way. Um, uh, But they're turned into superstition they've turned into folklore they've turned into um uh stories that we don't necessarily understand exactly where they've come from sometimes um in australia where i am there's a a much greater sort of understanding of celtic uh stuff because we have a, a strong celtic background here yeah yeah um so we do we do have it but even the you know the leprechauns on saint patrick's day um they have a very strong uh, Celtic mythological tradition that is sort of lost and it's all about luck and, you know, wearing green and things like that. But actually um, the leprechaun uh, connects to our need to work hard for things. It's actually not a lucky thing. He he works for his gold um, and the, the, folklore is you find a leprechaun and you shake yep. him upside down and he has yep. to give you his gold and that's actually a an awful story because this leprechaun has worked really hard for it <laughs> and you're stealing it from them and, and that, so the original stories were actually um the people who did that were punished and it was a it was a real kind of idea about you don't take from others who've worked really hard um, and the leprechaun sort of became quite capricious and quite um, uh, a trickster and was quite mean-spirited to the people who did that to them. Um, so so the stories get slightly shifted, but yeah. if you go back to them and you understand where they came from, they're, they're incredibly indicative of a Celtic attitude that people and hard work – and community and family are what is the the inherent important yeah. lifeblood of any community. Wow. Um, and the social norms around that. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, and again, sorry. Go ahead. Well, one uh, of the things I love about this is you have taken us on such a journey in this book. I, I can't even get to everything. I mean, I, I looked at both of these books that we were covering today and I thought, oh, we're going to do two hours. No. Uh, but before we go on to the next book, and I know I didn't talk about uh, uh, everything you put in here, how can people get copies of the book? How can they find out more about you? Yeah, so the book is um, pretty much available uh, anywhere you go. So it's uh, it's online. Amazon um, is a really good place to get it. Most bookshops, if they don't have it in there, they'll order it. Um, you can directly get it from the publisher. The Australian publisher is Rockpool Publisher and the distributor is Simon and Schulster. So it's pretty easy to get yep. um, uh, from different things. I have uh, my connection. I'm not a massive social media presence, I have to say. I'm, uh-huh. I'm a writer. I like writing. I don't uh-huh. like kind of <laughs> being on social media. But I do have a Facebook page, which is Gabin Mar and Author, and I have an Amazon author page both of which um, you can connect with me and you can ask questions or you can send me stuff or um, just sort of see what I'm up to and what I'm doing. Awesome. Gabby and Marin, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, yep, fasten your seatbelts, monsters and creatures. And by the way, I just want to say about the book, uh, we're going to give a copy of Gods and Goddesses away right now, 1-800-930-2819. 1-800-930-2819. The book is beautifully illustrated. When we come back, Monsters and Creatures, How I Live the First 10 Years of My Life. We'll be right back.
To see your life from an angel's perspective, book a personal consultation with Claire Candy Hoff, angelic walk-in angel Ariel at Angel Healing House. Candy provides intuitive counseling, Reiki, and angel readings in person in Los Angeles or nationally and internationally via phone or Skype. She will channel the practical tools you need to transform your life. Call now, 831-277-3716 or visit angelhealinghouse.com. Interested in deepening your spiritual practice? The School for Esoteric Studies offers online training to spiritual seekers from all paths of life and individual coaching. Our courses synthesize Eastern and Western spiritual traditions based on meditation, study, and service applied to everyday life. To learn more about our courses and services, please visit www.esotericstudies.net. How often do you find yourself wondering, why me? Learn a new shift in perspective to see how everything that takes place in your life is actually working for you and shifting you towards your own enlightenment. Tune in to Blank Enlightenment Radio with Misty Thompson each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more, visit MistyMThompson.com. That's MistyMThompson.com. Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasic has a special gift for everyone out there. To receive three chapters of the Knowledge Book as a special gift, send your email to mmjp99 at gmail.com. That's M as in Mary, M as in Mary, JP99 at gmail.com now to receive this fabulous, fabulous gift of the Knowledge Book. To find answers to life's questions, you need to look within yourself. Dr. Glenna Rice brings your questionable conversations on Transformation Talk Radio each month. Tune in each month for insight into how you can live up to your full potential. Dr. Glenna is a physical therapist, certified access consciousness, and access body class facilitator. How does it get any better than this? For more information on Dr. Glenna Rice and her work, visit GlennaRice.com. Welcome back. Yep, I'm loving this. Gabby and Marin joining me here today. The book now that we're going to talk about as we just gave a copy of Gods and Goddesses away. Uh, and we'd also let's Betty go. Let's give a copy of Monsters and Creatures away as well. 1-800-930-2819. Again, um, these books are beautifully illustrated. There are fantastic tables uh, that represent how to understand more about each of the deities, the cultures, and most importantly, what it is that we use symbolically, how we, how we bring both goddess, gods, goddesses, monsters, and creatures to life. Um, Gabby, thank you for joining us here today. We're going to, you know, we talk about the book about monsters and creatures and man, this is like never ending. What was it like to write this? Because I completely get a different vibe from this book, even though we're talking about both of these together. Yeah, it's, it, it does have a different vibe. Um, it, it was actually a lot more difficult. The gods and goddesses ones, I could kind of work chronologically. You could work through the, the civilizations and, and it had a structure. Um, finding a structure for this and trying to get across all of the things I wanted to talk about um, and all of the monsters and creatures that I love uh, was, was quite difficult. And it is, it is a small book um, comparatively. It's 35,000 words. So it... Um, I always had the idea I want these to be stories. I don't want it to be a beastery. I don't want it to be a dictionary or an encyclopedia. I want it to have a narrative. And I want people to kind of understand the origins yeah. um, of these ideas, of these creatures, and why they came up at the time they did and why they still resonate for us now. Um, so so that formed the basis of it, and then I just had to figure out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the tables um, are used in there. But 
I kind of thought about, well, generally what are the groupings of, of these so, sorts of creatures? What are the things that, uh, that link them? Um, and so I sort of started to think about them a little bit, almost like a zoologist um, in terms of putting together the, the different chapters. Yeah. I, I love, I, you know, I, I as I was reading the book and, uh, you know, I, I read the books through and then the books like these now will stay in my living room because I want to go back. And I'm fascinated with what you put in here. And again, the tables and the and the and the pictures, the illustrations are just beautiful. What were all right? What were your most important monsters and creatures that you absolutely had to get in this book yeah so i had to get vampires in as i mentioned before <laughs> uh, long long time relationship with that particular creature and also that is one of the archetypal creatures i mean you see vampire mythology in almost every culture yeah so it's it's such a incredibly potent um idea and it's also evolved so much so that was that was definitely one and i and also i mean we call it monsters and creatures um because they're not all scary you know i wanted to put in the ones that we love and come and do beautiful things for us and so yeah. um unicorns of course had to be in there and mermaids had to be in there but probably the ones that i really wanted in were the lesser known ones um ones that perhaps aren't as well loved or understood but are just fascinating um and there, there's a group in there um called the yokai which are a japanese um group of they're essentially kind of like japanese fairies uh -huh. in a way but they're possessed um objects they're umbrellas and pieces of fabric and uh and then they take on these kind of uh, personalities and sometimes they're nice and sometimes they're not but I love that idea that, you know, you can turn around and there's an umbrella and it's got an eye in it and it's looking at you and it can talk to you. Um, and that every day I, I just thought was fabulous and that had to be in there because that seems like a really modern idea, but that's been around in Japan for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, so those, those less common... And that's what I love about what you did is it's not only, of course, the more popular werewolf vampire but i was really fascinated by the monsters and creatures i didn't know I, I mean i'm glad you paid respect to vampires because that definitely was you know my where i was as a kid and we certainly are aware of the popularity of the zombie mm. right now right um yes. But the other thing I'm really struck by is how we're starting to see or resonate with beast-like creatures that have um, kind energy. I don't know the other word for it. Yeah. We're starting to get a sense of that. Um, and what do I mean by that? You know, certainly we know the whole beauty and the beast thing. But mm -hmm. here... You know, we just had Shape of Water come out and yes. people are looking at uh, a film that most people didn't think would get 15 minutes of attention and looking at this monstrous type creature and a love relationship. And mm -hmm. can I ask you this in all the research and everything you've done? Is that a misconception? about monsters and creatures is the misconception uh and maybe rightly so that they're heartless <laughs> yeah i think i think that's absolutely right um my favorite monster and i i, I oh. put my hands up to this completely is medusa from yeah. um, greek mythology and yeah. and the thing that i'm so fascinated about her is how she's been completely misunderstood as a monster if you actually look mm -hmm. at what her story, she was turned into a Gorgon to save her from uh, Poseidon, who was the, king, the god of the sea, who had uh, essentially attacked her. And she's she's done that. She's, she's turned into that by Athena to protect her. Um, and then she goes away. She doesn't attack people. She doesn't go on a rampage. She doesn't right. try and, 
you know, cause revenge or wreak havoc. She goes away and she tries to live a quiet life. And when people disturb her, they pay a price for that. But she's certainly not aggressive in any way. So this idea that she's a monster is really um, quite misunderstood. She She's actually a, a representation of power. Um, and that can be scary, particularly if it's embodied as a woman. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, it's you know, she's such a beautiful um, story and such a strong, important story for women, um, but also for men to sort of understand that women aren't there just for their benefit. <laughs> you know, we have our own lives and we, we want to do them without being bothered sometimes. <laughs> You know, as I read this, and let me stop for a moment and just absolutely um, make sure that folks know how to find out more about you and how to get a copy of the book Monsters and Creatures. Take, let's take a moment and do that. And Benny, I, I hope you've gotten the phone number 1-800-930-2819. Give a copy of this book away. Please tell us the book's available everywhere, right? Yeah, pretty much everywhere. So if you go to a bookshop, you can ask for it. Um, you can either ask for it by the title or by author name, um, but also online. It's on Amazon um, and you can get it through pretty much any online bookstore uh, as well as through the publishers, Rockpool Publishing and the distributor, Simon and Schulster. Okay. Monster that I got to talk about. I'm not saying it's my favorite, mm -hmm. but I am going to say that I'm not sure what age you start at, but pretty much when you say this, everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. All right? So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, of course, there may be some people that have never heard of the Loch Ness Monster, right? Does it get a lot of publicity? Not going to get the big movies, right? But quite popular. And I believe a large majority of people really think it exists. What do you think? Yeah, I, yeah, it's an incredibly enduring um, creature. And, and the first uh, mention of it was way, way back in the Middle Ages where a, uh, well, the equivalent of a priest, but a holy man reported seeing a monster dragging a person into the into the lock. And a lock is essentially a large lake. Um and, of course, holy people um, were believed and trusted. Of course, why, you know, the, the, what was said was similar of a, you know, a very respected news outlet. So <laughs> there certainly was something there um, at some point. Um, there's been a lot of sightings, and I, I think I mentioned in the book that there have been, you know, sightings pretty much every month, uh, forever. So it's a it's a very interesting, um, yeah, yeah, uh, enduring thing. But part of it, and there's been a lot of research. So they've ultrasounded the lake, they've um, explored it with all sorts of um, scientific equipment. Uh, there are a number of people who are absolutely adamant that there is a creature there, and our inability to find it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means it has abilities to hide from us that we don't understand. And that's that's essentially now <clears throat> the narrative of it. Although yeah. I read a really interesting one, I, I mentioned this in the book, there is a man who spent his entire life um, researching the Loch Ness Monster and he came out quite recently and said, well, actually I think the Loch Ness Monster no longer exists because she's been a, a victim of climate change. Oh, and that and that is and and so we've lost her because of climate change and and I I think wow um, this is a new chapter in this in this yeah. story because the lake is such an important element um, so yeah I think that it's a it's a key it's a key story in that area but it's also a, a universal story about you know, what we, don't, what we don't understand and we see something and we don't know what it is. All right. I'm going to save this one for last, but I got to ask, and I'm not exactly sure where it fits. How popular right now 
how popular have our dragons getting? And I am not even going to mention Game of Thrones. No. But I'm just saying, <laughs> how popular, right? What are we up yeah. to? Dragonheart 5 or something? But, yeah. but across the board, ages, right? Where yeah. did they fit in? So unlike most of the other creatures in the book, um, and I say most, it's not all of them, but most of the creatures, we kind of know that they're stories. There's not a lot of evidence for them. But you talk about a dragon, and we know there were dragons. They're dinosaurs, right? There are bones. There are There were dinosaurs that flew. There were dinosaurs that were massive and huge and terrifying. And so... The the idea of them is based in a reality that perhaps we haven't seen in a lot of the other stories, and that's what keeps them going. But what's really fascinating about the dragon is how different it is across culture. So the the Asian dragon, the Chinese dragon, uh, doesn't have wings but flies, um, is incredibly elemental, so really connected to fire, to earth, to water, um, and and to the different points of, of direction. And so they're, they're incredibly connected to our sense, again, of the place we live. Um, and that's part of their the joy of them and the fire. I mean, that's so elemental, isn't it, that, that yeah. idea that these, these incredible um, beasts can just do that. And, of course, you know, we see... Um, lots of, of versions of that, but I think that's our most popular, certainly in, in Western thought, is the fire-breathing lizard-like dragon that is essentially um, almost unstoppable, really, um, when you sort of think about it. And of course, Game of Thrones is showing that. <laughs> so. Well, I want to. I, I know we're just about. Uh, we filled the entire hour, and I, I want to thank you, Gavian, for for this. Um, I got to ask you one last question, both about gods and goddesses and monsters and creatures. If you could do a little predicting over the next three years, which of these energies do you see emerging in our cultures? I know I put you on the spot. Sorry. No, that's okay. I actually think I was thinking about this actually the other day, and I think the Frankenstein idea yeah. Um, with all the new kind of AI and this idea of, you know, we can we can create essentially biometric people, um, and this sort of you know being able to digitally print organs and all this sort of stuff. That's the kind of thing that's going to bring back the fears and also the the sort of the opportunities that Frankenstein was born out of. Um, And so I think we're going to start to see a lot more of that kind of idea of what is human and and what is death and what is life. And, and, and Frankenstein was never a zombie. He was, he was very specifically um, a person and, and someone who was created in a way that was problematic, but who, who definitely had a soul and a conscious and, 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 and loved and feared and and all of that stuff. So I think we're going to start to see a bit more of a resurgence of those sort of stories. Yeah, I I think you're right about those. And, you know, I think you're right about them in a lot of ways. I was reading a medical article uh, today and it reminded me of some of the research they're doing right now uh, and some of the research they're doing on cloning and so forth. Mm-hmm. And I think about that and I think about what are we talking about here? You, you know, are we sort of in that realm that once upon a time, the whole Frankenstein thing seems so bizarre, but have we now moved into a different realm of possibilities? And I think that we're, I, I agree with you on this. And I also agree that it's going to challenge the ethical considerations Definitely. that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to thank that- you. For yeah, go ahead. So I was going to say that's the whole point of these stories is for us to actually um, think about and examine what's happening in our world. Yep. Yep. 
and, and that's why we so relate to them. You know, that's why when we look at what shows up in our pop cultures and what kind of movies are getting produced and, you know, what what kinds of things are people being drawn to? Why was Wonder Woman such a phenomenon? Right. You yeah. know, what is it about all of that that becomes so endearing to people? You know, what is it that our fascination with monsters, creatures, gods, and goddesses what is the gap? What is the hole that it fulfills for us? And I yeah. think that, you know, by what you've written in the book, you give us a lot to think about in that area, don't, don't you, right? Yeah, well, that's that was the point of writing it, really, from my point of view. As I said, it's not an encyclopedia. It's really an opportunity for people to think about these things in a little bit more depth and, and draw the correlations. Wow. Uh, thank you for today. One last question for you. What's your personal message? What would you like to leave us with? Oh, gee, I have so many. I think just be kind to everybody. That's, I think, kindness awesome. is so underrated, actually. So be kind. I love it. Thank you, Gabby Ann Murren. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm Dr. Pat. We'll see you next time. Thank you.